Greetings, everyone. I'm Rebecca B.J. Allen, and I'm with the Million Vegan Grandmothers, and we have a special guest today, Keith Akers. Welcome, Keith. Hi, B.J. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, Keith Akers is a writer and activist and has published four books, Embracing Limits, A Radical and Necessary Approach to the Environmental Crisis. That's his most recent book. Disciples, how the Christian, how Jewish Christianity shaped Jesus and shattered the church. The Lost Religion of Jesus, Simple Living and Nonviolence in Early Christianity, and a vegetarian source book. He's also been published in Veg News and Vegetarian Times and many other places in his former life. He was a computer consultant with the US Department of State and Education. American Management Systems, Bell Atlantic, which is now Verizon, and others. He's been researching environmental issues since the 1970s when he attended the first rally of Earth Day. His website is Compassionate Spirit, and he's recently made an appearance in the documentary Christ Spiracy. I am so pleased to be able to speak with you today. Uh, how long has it been? Uh, that you've been a vegetarian and vegan. Tell us how you entered in this fashion. <laughs> well, you want the short story or the long story? The short story is <laughs> I read uh, I read Animal Liberation about 1978, and that convinced me to go uh, vegetarian. And there was a I read just read a couple of sentences of the uh, chapter on factory farming. I said, that's it. <laughs> I'm I'm going vegetarian. And and because I could see that he was describing about how chickens, cows were, dairy cows were treated as well, I said probably I should go vegan. But first, I'm going to go vegetarian, and then I'll, once I've got that figured out, uh, I can try veganism. And then about two and a half years later, I did uh, go go vegan. Uh, so and that was in 1980. So it's been a long time, and I've seen a lot of a uh, lot of things change in the in the movement. I've seen a lot of uh, great increase in the number of uh, uh, vegans and vegetarians. Uh, we've gone from the point of view where we, we wouldn't even want to, to be, we want to be cautious about saying vegan at all, or even vegetarian. And we would, we would make jokes about using the V word. You don't want to use the V word. And that and those at the beginning, that meant even vegetarian, but uh, now it's like, it's everywhere. Right, right. Uh, it is everywhere, and yet still people are sometimes cautious, especially, say, for instance, I've heard in India, where we have uh, people new to it, right? New and not new, because there have been vegans there for centuries also. Um, and I wonder about the word vegetarian and veganism. I'll just bring it right up in this book um, about Jesus, right? And yes. the early Judeo-Christians, uh, or Jewish Christians, yes, and and why why there sometimes you use vegetarian and sometimes vegan, and then I was reading that you had said that somebody said that James wouldn't even wear wool, and so that kind of feels like vegan to me. So maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about that um, that early Christianity. We'll just start in there just a bit. Sure, the the difficulty revolves partially around our definition of veganism and uh, partially around our knowledge of the early sources and so forth. The concept of veganism doesn't really exist. The word, word doesn't exist really before 1944. And the concept doesn't really exist before, uh, before uh, the 19th century. Uh, it's, it's, you can find people that are sort of saying, well, uh, this and that about dairy, you can say, well, they were probably vegan uh, or something like that. But uh, it's really hard to, to parse out what they're talking about. And part of the reason revolves around the idea of uh, use of an animal. Uh, a vegan is someone who, as far as practical and possible, uh, doesn't use or exploit animals in, in any way. And what did that mean in the ancient world? Well, the, a lot of transportation and agriculture in the ancient world relied on animals. And how are you going to do that? Uh, how are you going to get from, you know, 
from uh, Palestine to Antioch or wherever uh, without uh, without an animal. You could do it. You could you'd have to walk a lot. Uh, but I don't think that people had that concept uh, at that time. They were they the idea of kindness to animals existed, but I don't think the idea of not using them uh, existed. It wasn't actually until the invention of the uh, of the automobile and the railroad that people uh, started uh, uh, started thinking, oh well, we don't have to use animals at all. And, uh, and in fact, there was the, I, there was I've forgotten his name, but there was a an early animal rights activist in the 19th century who uh, once he realized that he could get anywhere in England um, using the train, he said, well, now I don't have to use a horse. Uh, and, and this was sort of a sort of a breakthrough. And we sort of take that sort of mechanical uh, backdrop for, for, for granted in modern society. Uh, but in ancient society, it wasn't wasn't quite as clear. So that's the main reason. But I think that that uh, the early Christians we certainly uh, had a plant-based diet, and it's uh, pretty much all plants. Uh, dairy and eggs actually were fairly uncommon uh, in the ancient world, because in the ancient world, dairy, it couldn't really be a commercial venture, because to make it a commercial venture, you'd have to ship it somewhere, uh, even if it was just like a day away. Uh, and, you know, milk doesn't really, uh, really keep that well. Whereas for an animal, you could the animal sort of provides its own transportation. You can just drive the animal to wherever you want it and then kill it there. Uh, you don't have to uh, think about preserving the meat or anything like that. Uh, so it's uh, storage is is that much of an issue. So, uh, meat very rare in the ancient world. The one percent, the one percent in ancient society are those who could go into the meat market and think about buying meat, uh, other than on very special occasions. And I talk about that in the uh, in in both of my books on the, the history of early Christianity. I see. So, uh, seeing an animal being hurt, uh, James didn't want the animal hurt. For example, we don't know this, but yes, yes. Uh, so he would not eat wool because it's hurting an animal. So that makes me think of the whole basic golden rule of not harming yes. others, and yes. and like all of our children and grandchildren, my students and nieces, nobody wants to harm an animal, but if they don't see it, uh, yes, it's a different exactly. thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how did you move from this early study of uh, Christianity? For instance, you have so many resources, you've been studying it for years, right? Yes. Yes. And, yeah, then, much. Uh -huh, and then into embracing limits. Um, you, you moved into the environmental section, or maybe you have been doing that concurrently. How did that happen? <laughs> well, actually, I was, uh, I've was i been doing environmental research all along. As you recall, my first book, a vegetarian source book, I had a third of the book devoted to environmental issues, uh, the section on vegetarian ecology. And I talked about many of the same things I do in Embracing Limits, uh, soil erosion, groundwater depletion, uh, and so forth. All these kinds of issues uh, come out in a, a vegetarian source book. So I was aware of them uh, for a long time and was even doing some uh, research on it. Uh, and I got into uh, the, it's actually, you could ask well, how I got into the, the Christianity aspect, but I saw that this was an area which was not well researched uh, uh, in, the, in either the scholarly literature or the popular uh, vegetarian vegan literature either. Uh, and so I said, well, this is, this would be easy. I could do that. <laughs> and so I wrote uh, lost religion of Jesus and, and, uh, and then went on to write disciples as well. So it's, I think all of my work, uh, I'm a little bit eclectic. I tend to move to, into areas that other people don't touch. If they, in the 1980s, nobody was talking about the environment in vegetarian vegan circles. Uh, they were. They would say, "Oh, well, it takes a lot of land," and they would sort of let it. Uh, to 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 do, it takes a lot of land to do livestock agriculture, and they would sort of let it drop there. But uh, anything further, uh, not was wasn't really uh, discussed very much. So I was attracted to that and Christianity because Christianity wasn't really uh, researched. And when I first started looking at Christianity, uh, which was actually still while I was doing a vegetarian source book. I, my initial take was that uh, Christianity was anti-vegetarian. 
And I found a lot of the passages in Paul where he says, eat anything uh, sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. And I tended to sort of paint the whole movement uh, in those terms. But then when I got into the history of early Christianity, I saw that it was uh, much more complex than that, and that Paul indeed had opponents. And his opponents were vegetarian. And in fact, his opponents were probably the leaders of the early church. And so uh, that leads us to believe the question, the whole concept that Jesus went along with all the stuff about eating, eating meat. And in fact, I, I think he did not. I think he was uh, totally plant-based and, uh, you know, and intended, and the movement was intended to be uh, that way from the beginning. And if you look at the Jewish Christian uh, literature and the recognitions and the homilies, uh, sources like that, uh, you, you can see that one of the main things they're against is they're against animal sacrifice. It comes up constantly, the bloody animal sacrifices, we reject those uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, so I think that the, uh, I think the case for Jesus being uh, a vegetarian or vegan, depending on your definition of veganism, uh, uh, is, is very strong. I think, I think it's very strong. Uh, and the whole, in fact, the entire movement, the entire, entire movement, the early Christian movement got disrupted in a major way after the destruction of the temple in, in, in Jerusalem after the year 70. So after this, the whole movement changes. And that's, the, that's what, what I wanted to look at. And so you have to uh, be careful to look at the early sources to find out what the movement really was like. That is so fascinating in my whole life of being brought up um, first in the Baptist church and then the Unitarian church. Well, Methodist church was in there too as a youngster. Um, I don't remember hearing anything about uh, Jesus and uh, not eating animals, but it was certainly kind to animals because, you know, a representation of the kindest person in the world. And so as a child, uh, it would make sense that if he's a kind person, he wouldn't want to harm animals as well as people. But I don't remember yes. hearing that preached even even recently. Yeah, very interesting. Yes. And also, you talk about simple living in that uh, in that book about uh, the lost religion of Jesus. And in your book on embracing limits, you talk about oh, there's so many incredible things in this book. I'm only the part way through, but driving through Austin the other day, we saw so much new buildings and my friends were saying, gosh, there's so much building going on. And it, it reminded me of the degrowth chapter that you have. Yes. And how are we going to degrow our society, uh, live simply, uh, and, and you've written about it. What would you like to say to us about that? Well, the thing we have to understand about climate and all the other environmental issues that we face is that it's bigger than just climate change. Climate is an important part about it, a part of it, and we certainly should be thinking seriously about climate. It's, the situation now seems to be almost completely out of control. Uh, all the, the scientists are tearing their hairs out and say, look at this data, and everybody's going, well, whatever. Uh, and so uh, it's a serious problem, no doubt about it, but it's a bigger problem than just climate. We can't really deal with climate without dealing with the whole problem of our economy expanding beyond sustainable limits, because we're not just unsustainable in terms of climate. We're unsustainable in, in many other ways as well. We're unsustainable in terms of our relationship with soil and water. Uh, and in relationship with just the metals that we're extracting uh, from the, the earth and all the plastic that we're making. I found an interesting uh, piece of data that said that uh, a study that reported that the total mass of all man-made artifacts from you know roads, buildings, uh, junk, plastic in the ocean, whatever, all of this now outweighs all living things on earth. Oh my it's Actually, there's more of more of it than there is not only of us but of all of all uh, all plant matter all bacteria animals everything including humans 
uh, on the planet. And people just don't understand the scale of what we've done and how the, the, the planet has become so homogenized to be composed basically of, well, us. It's us and our livestock. That's about it. If you look out on the landscape in terms of large animals, that's it. So I think the people have to realize that there's going to be a lot more involved than just, uh, you know, going to renewable energy, which is going to be a, a, a major task in itself, uh, going into renewable energy and building lots of, uh, of wind turbines and solar panels and things like that. Not a bad idea, but it's not enough. It's not nearly enough that we, we we're going to run out of, uh, of lots of other things, uh, not literally run out, but we will get to the point where it will become harder and harder uh, to acquire oil. It will be harder and harder to acquire all the metals and minerals, which depend on this intensive use of energy, and to transport it all across, all across the globe. So it, we have to rethink our whole society. And that's sort of where I get back into the simple living and, the, and Christianity. Uh, Christianity is not unique here uh, by any means, or at least early Christianity before, before it got uh, distorted. Uh, is not unique in recommending this kind of simple uh, living. But that's the kind of world we need to be thinking about. We need to be uh, not just constantly expanding, growing, uh, building, uh, it can't go on forever. And in fact, we probably overshot our, our uh, sustainable boundaries uh, quite a bit already. We have to actually shrink shrink the economy. Agriculture is probably one of the key ways that we can shrink uh, the economy because as we all know, livestock is extremely inefficient mm -hmm. in terms of resource use. Right. And so individually, we can continue to, for all of us here, eat plant-based and for others to move more to a plant-based diet and then gradually become more aware of the wool and all of those kinds of vegan things. But in your book, you have, there's so many things, there's soil and, uh, yes. yeah, and oil and <laughs> so many things. Soil and oil. Yeah. <laughs> soil and oil. So our awareness is one thing. In terms of our actions, I think maybe it comes down to not buying so much. And I think you you talked about if we try to envision ourselves with um, so many electrical appliances. I mean, how many can we keep? Shall we keep buying electrical appliances and and where can we individually and then of course your book is also about collectively what do you think about us individually well the thing is i wouldn't beat we can't beat ourselves up too much about not living environmentally because it's dependent upon our society uh, our society is such that uh, in the united states today you're either a consumer or you're homeless. It's like there's no in between. It's not like in the 19th century when Walden could and, and Walden when Thoreau could just go to the edge of the city and grow beans. You can't go to the edge of the city and grow beans these days. You can't even find the edge of the city. And if you did find the edge of the city, you'd find another suburb and it would go on. And uh, you know, you you just could couldn't do it. Our society is, is has developed to the point where it's very difficult to truly live simply. We can do some things, but there are other things that we can't do. And one of the examples I talked about in my book is the example of a bicycle. A bicycle is the most efficient form of transportation that humans have. You can't use it all the time, but when you can use it, it's like you can go there, go from point A to point B much more efficiently uh, than any other means uh, uh, means of transportation. In fact, it's even more efficient than walking. It's even more efficient than walking. And it's also the most efficient form of transportation in nature. So in terms of a cougar going, getting from point A to point B and saying how fast it moves, and how much, how much, uh, how much it weighs and so forth, that in terms of bicycles that can, can convey the same amount of, of, uh, uh, of weight, the same distance, maybe not as fast, but it can do it at the same distance uh, much, much more efficiently than anything in, 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 in nature or that we've devised so far. So, but, so you say, oh, let's ride bicycles. Well, 
let's ride bicycles. Okay, have you been out on the street lately in the highway traffic trying to ride a bicycle? It's dangerous. Our society is not built for bicycles. It is built for cars because that's where the money is. That's how you, you're going to make money. You're not going to make a lot of money selling bicycles. You can make a few, uh, you, know, you know, a few dollars here and there. And there are some bicycle companies. But if you want to make the big money on transportation, you got to sell people you know, a, a car, preferably an SUV that's big and expensive. You know, that, that's the way, that, that's the way to, to, to make money. And so our society develops for with highways instead of uh, bicycle paths. Right. And so we, ha and we have to deal with that. So, and there's different ways we can fight against that. And I think that we need to, to, to draw together and think of those, uh, what those ways are um, in order to change, uh, to change society uh, so that we, we, it would be possible in the first place uh, to live more simply. I think you're right. I think I heard an interview where you said that social justice, if we, <laughs> we're going to have to do social justice be so we don't uh, leave people behind. I mean, they're already being people yes. left behind. Right. Yeah. 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 The whole, the, the big, the big concern that people have about degrowth is, wait a minute, we're broke. You know, we can't, we can't, I can't shrink my income any further. And what about all the, the people that are living on a dollar or $2 a day, uh, out in various parts of the world, uh, you can't ask them to get into degrowth. This is degrowth mostly in the Western societies. I think that uh, there are probably some, some countries that are, are less developed uh, that, that uh, maybe don't have to, to grow at all or, or, or don't have to degrow at all. But I think that uh, within every country in the United States and also in other foreign countries as well, you have growing any massive inequality. You've got a few people have a lot of stuff and you've got everybody else that's essentially either literally or almost uh, out on the streets. And so it's, it's a problem. What are you gonna do about inequality? And who's doing all the carbon emissions? Who's doing all the consuming? Who's destroying the earth? It's the people who have a bunch of money. That's basically what it is. And so we need uh, social equality, uh, we need a movement towards social equality, and this goes hand in hand with the idea of degrowth, because one of the things that you could do is just shrink all this equality, uh, inequality back down, uh, and so that the rich aren't consuming so much, and, and that would take care of quite a bit of the problem uh, just right there. So I think that we have to pursue social justice and degrowth at the same time. Right. Wow. And that makes me think of the early Christianity that you were writing about, uh, the Ebionites, I'm not sure how to say that, but simple living and living poorly, how do you say it? <laughs> uh, Ebionites, uh, that no one knows. I mean, uh, let's see, I'm not sure. The thing is, we don't even know how Latin was pronounced by the, by the Romans, and I'm not sure how ancient Hebrew was pronounced by the, by, by the ancient Jews. Uh, but so it's uh, we 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 don't know. But uh, but I I pronounce it Ebionites because that's that's the way it looks like in, in English when you write write out the word. But if somebody comes to uh, uh, says Ebionites, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> I'm not going to make a big fuss about it. All right, all right. So they lived they lived simply, and yes. and um, right right okay. Well, this is just fascinating. Uh, do you have a particular limit that you want us to focus on? Or is it like you said, be gentle with yourself, but um, I, is it go vegan? <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's for starters. Actually, one of the things I, I points I make in my book is that of all the things we have to do in order to, to decrease our energy use, bring climate under control and, and things like that and reduce consumption of materials uh, and evolve toward some sort of sustainability, of all the things we have to do, probably veganism is actually the easiest. It's actually the easiest. You try getting, uh, converting our current energy system to, uh, uh, to, a renewable, to a renewable economy. It would, first of all, I don't think you can, you, can, you can really do it. I don't think you could, I think it's impossible basically. Uh, but uh, I think you could get closer and you could have a reasonable standard of living on a lower, lower uh, consumption. 
of energy. But it would be, it, even if it, if it can be done, and some people say, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're making a lot of progress on renewables and, and, and solar panels are becoming more efficient and so forth. And they may be right. Batteries are getting cheaper. Uh, people will give you that kind of argument. They may be right. But still, it's a massive undertaking. We're talking trillions of dollars. We're talking about, you know, decades uh, of work. We're talking about huge increase in materials use, at least temporarily, while we get all the renewable system uh, set up. Uh, so uh, it, it's a massive undertaking. It, it, it will require, uh, essentially, it will require what we would call sacrifices. It will call, require sacrifices of the American people. And people do not have a glimmer of this. People do not have, understand that this is what we're talking about. And nobody wants to talk about it either because the renewable opponents, the renewable proponents don't want to say, uh, well, this is going to cost a lot of money, so get ready for a, a big bill. Uh, it, I mean, then people are going to say, well, forget it. <laughs> so they don't, they, don't want to, they don't want to confront the issue. But the uh, others, the conservatives don't want to, the conservative on, on, on uh, the need for energy reform, I would say, uh, don't want to don't want to um, confine it either because they know that climate is a big deal and that people are concerned about it. So everybody just sort of sits there and says, "Well, maybe we should consume more sustainably," and they sort of let it go at that. But you, we, if we want to look at the nitty gritty, we'll see that actually veganism is one of the easier. We already have the technology to grow plants. We've been doing it for thousands of years. So it's. It's not like this is some some something new that we have to come up with. Uh, so and that so that's I think that's the direction we ought to go in. We ought to uh, we ought to to uh, think about and come to grips with this in terms of uh, society. We, the whole society has to come to the grips with the fact that there are limits to growth. There's no two ways about it. It doesn't matter who gets elected. It doesn't matter. Trump can't change it. Biden can't change it. Nobody can change it. It's, it's simply physics. It's simply physics. And so uh, and so our society will change. It will change massively. We don't know how rapid it will be. We don't know exactly where we're going. Uh, we know that the, the social situation is very chaotic. But, uh, but since that's the framework that we need to be thinking in terms of. And when you put it that way, veganism looks like, well, we could do that with no problem. Wow, that's wonderful. That makes sense. That makes sense. I had heard about a survey where people said, would you rather uh, give up meat or give up your car? And they all chose to give up the meat rather than the car. But when you look at all of the things that you've just talked about, it, it's, it's wonderful. That's great. Great to know yes. there's something simple we can do. Well, yes, yes. So I would say we, we, need, we need to find other people that understand this problem. The, the people who understand the, the whole problem of limits to growth, it's like maybe one in a thousand people might understand this. Uh, the numbers are growing, but it's still very small. And there's all different, the, the opinions among the degrowth community are all over the map. Some people say, well, we need to do this or we need to do that. Uh, and, and they're wildly different. But we need to get together, we need to figure it out, and then we need, need to convince, first of all, convince the, the vegans yeah. and the animal rights people that we need a big social change. And then we need to convince the environmental movement, and then we need to take that to the general population. Yes, wow. So education. That's education to, for now, yes. You can certainly change yourself. Certainly, you should go vegan. Uh, certainly, you should change yourself in other ways ride a bicycle that's not too dangerous, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but uh, the important thing, uh, I think, is to, is to live as simply as you can and to draw together so that we can uh, uh, think about how we can accomplish this sort of massive social change, which is going to come, but, uh, uh, but uh, we don't know exactly uh, when or how. Wow. Thank you so much, Keith. This has been so wonderful in our our children, our grandchildren, and the grandchildren of all the species uh, need to to move forward with this understanding so we can make some progress here and, not, and, and still have an Earth. Would you like to say any final words? Well, I'm going to be at VCOP 17, and uh, my name is Keith Akers, and I'm going to talk about all this stuff, and I hope to see you there.
Thank you so much, Keith. That was fabulous. That was fabulous.